So today's topic is uh, synergic settings. There is machines out in the market that will tell you a material thickness rather than an amperage or wire feed rates or voltages or everything. What it is is the wire feed rate and the voltage on the MIG machine need to be balanced. That's what they call synergic. So for low settings, a low wire speed matches a low voltage, a high wire speed matches a high voltage and anywhere in between and that makes what they call a synergic curve. So every manufacturer has their own thing how this should work. Every wire manufacturer has their own idea of how this should work and they publish books and they have stuff online where they show where they think which wire runs the best how. Then there is a certain travel speed that the wire manufacturer typically gives you in inches per minute how fast you move the gun in a certain setting. Um, the wire manufacturer may or may not give this to you Welding engineers will spec this in what they call the procedure, where they spec preheating, interpass temperature, post heating, if applicable. And the way how all this works together, that's what makes welding complicated, let's say. If you have something that needs to meet certain code specifications where all this becomes um, important, that everything is being followed exactly, that's where stuff gets complicated. Now let's take a look at a machine and see how they do the thickness settings. So today we're talking about this HTP ProPulse 200 machine. I recently made a video on a Miller Multimatic 200 um, Lincoln Power MIG 210 MP, uh, Hover Freight Vulcan OmniPro 220 and an Everlast 211 SI multiprocess I believe. If you want to see how, tho how those guys do the material thickness, take a look at that video. I'll put a link in the description. The way how the HTTP guys do it here is they give you a display and this display shows a wire feed rate, a voltage, the deviation of the synergic curve, and a material thickness rating, and an estimated approximate amperage that the machine will be putting out at that at those settings. Now first you go in your program and you pick in my case see a mild steel wire or 30 diameter. This can be welded with the majority argon with a balance between 8 and 25 percent CO2 which means it would work with like a 90-10, it would work with an 80-20 or a 75-25. The machine will automatically adjust for whatever it needs. You see your program in the top here. I'm in MIG 2T. You pull the trigger on, you let go of it off. So you can adjust the material thickness here from 23 thousandths all the way up to quarter inch. So today I have it set at about 400 inches a minute, uh, about 80 thousandths material thickness. And as you see there's multiple clicks here at 79 thousandths and you wonder how come, how does that work? So these numbers, although it let's suggest with the three digits behind the point is pretty accurate, but it's not really all that accurate. These numbers are more, uh, I want to call it suggestion to get you in the ballpark. It depends on how hot or cold your material is. It depends on your welding position, the configuration of the joint. It depends on a lot of things. We'll get into that in a minute then if I feel that this is too hot or too cold at that wire feed rate I can adjust the voltage take some voltage out or add some voltage to it that number here turns red I found that the factory setting is about to my likings then I have a few other options here uh, inductance the arc to make it more crisp or soft uh, start speed to not have machine gun start burn back timer and pinch that clips the ball off the end of the MIG wire electrically a pre-flow and a post-flow gas option so now let's talk a little bit about joint configurations so this is the material I have here that I'll be using today inch and a half square tubing uh, 14 gauge wall thickness which I believe is 083 or something to that matter my paperwork said. Um, the way how you can weld these tubes is you can do a butt joint 
and then you can weld it with a gap or without a gap. Uh, you could do a lap joint where these overlap and you weld like right here. You can do a T joint where you weld around all the way like this. Now when we take a look at this a little bit closer, the joint that requires the least heat would be a butt joint with a gap, with an open root. Now here you would be probably all the way on the lowest end of that setting because you don't want to burn holes in it, you actually want to be able to bridge the gap and weld over it. The joint that the, um, takes the second least amount would be just a straight up butt joint, which that's probably in the medium range of that setting. Then if you would do a lap joint, if these pieces overlap like this now, you have the material thickness here and the material thickness there to go into and some extra material back here that acts like a heat sink. So now for sure you would be on the upper end of the material setting. If you would weld them like this, now you have even more material that acts like a heat sink. So that could even be a higher setting maybe even a setting that is out of the range of that material thickness. If you would do a joint in this configuration, here you have two pieces like a T-joint and then here you have two pieces plus like almost the third piece back here sucking the heat out. So that would technically require a higher setting. Now the way how most people make up for this they may, instead of going back and adjusting the machine 10,000 times during a day, they make up for it with travel speed. On, on pieces where less heat input is required, they just weld faster. On pieces where there's more heat input required, they just weld a little bit slower. If you look at plate material, this happens to be 10 gauge, 135,000 you can do the same thing here. Open root, butt joint, lap joint, where now you're almost doubling the material thickness here, or T joint, where you have an extra heat sink built in to suck the um, heat out. So what a lot of people do, and the manufacturers often won't tell you what their settings are really there for. Some manufacturers figure a butt joint, some manufacturers figure a lap joint, some manufacturers figure a straight line MIG push or pull, some manufacturers figuring something with like uh, some torch manipulation like some swirls, cursive E, some up and down motion, some C-shape motion, whatever. The slower you go, the more gun manipulation you do, the higher is your heat input on the part rather than on the machine like dialing the machine up that's how you also get away welding thicker material with a small machine multiple passes with a lot of gun manipulation trying to put heat into your part now this is flat in position 1G whatever you want to call it if this whole thing happens vertically up it's a whole nother animal vertically up you need a whole lot less heat setting on the machine to not make the wire drippy especially if you use the ER70S6 and not an S3 wire the silicon in the wire makes the puddle more fluid makes it more prone to drip so you typically you have reduced settings for going vertical up slightly reduced settings for going overhead versus an in position weld so this is where you need to make up with gun manipulation or adjust the settings so you can't say it's eighth inch material I set it to eighth inch and it has to be correct that's why every manufacturer has their own little twist on how much how hot what do they do and how does it work it also matters how hot or cold this material is this one here has a ton of mill scale on it if I was gonna go grind this all shiny and smooth the heat requirement would be a lot less where the heat requirement with mill scale is a lot more to burn through this 
layer of basically crap to penetrate into good material and make it stick to eliminate cold fusion like you see in the picture right now. So now to see how all of this works in real life, I'm going to be welding up uh, three of these little frames. I'm going to experiment with the settings a little bit um, and I guess I'm going to experiment are you going to experiment with some frame settings? Yes. I'm the editor. I'm going to experiment with some frame settings. Not with some frame settings, with some settings, settings on the, for the frame. comes my little advertising to you guys. Uh, I don't do Patreon, I don't do online panhandling, I have a successful welding business, or what does successful mean? It feeds the family, alright? Um, if you guys want to know what tools I use, what I do, where I get my equipment from, um, I made a couple videos on some rods I've been using, which uh, that's like, kind of like the secret to cast iron and some other stuff where Sometimes it's really hard when you first start out to know where to even get your shit from. If you want to know what I use, it works for me. What I'll do is um, I'll put a link to the saw, the blade, and the description. It works really well with mild steel tubing, uh, aluminum, everything. I use a lot for 45 minor cuts. I got bigger saws, whatever. But I'll show you. I'll put a link in the description for a couple of the things that I use. If you want them, great. If you don't want them, great. Whatever. You're not hurting my feelings. So that's the same blade. I definitely got my life worth out of it. How long did we use it? Like a year or so? Year and a half? All right, another good tip is measure the height of your table. See, this one is pretty much exactly four inches. And then go to your scrap metal shelf, pull out a four by four tube, set this under. That helps you to keep this all nice and plumb and so you don't get any crooked cuts. Sparks, absolutely clean cut, fast, cool to the touch. So although the saw is set up to cut 45, I still laid this out a little bit so I can keep my saw blade just on the right side of the line. <laughs> 